Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I really need to figure out how to run our intro video, uh, transition smoothly between our video and our show from my home uh, setup here. So I, I got to work on that. But Spencer Israel here with Joel Conan and Dennis Dick on today's show. We are talking about the continuation of this buy the dip mentality we are seeing. Uh, also, the strength in tech yesterday, the weakness in the financials. And we'll take your questions from our chats, all of them, the chat on YouTube, the chat on Benzinga Pro, and the chat on premarket.benzinga.com. Our guest today is Craig Erlum, Chief Market Strategist at Oanda. He will join the show at 8.35. Eastern time from across the pond. Uh, bring Joel on now. Joel, give us the word here in the overnight session. What's happening? Ah, uh, we are up eleven and a quarter handles. Had a little dip in the overnight session. Uh, we got to the same intraday lows as we had on Thursday. Or excuse me, on Friday and Monday, twenty eight ninety four fifty, and we just turned around and we've been steadily climbing for the remainder of the night. We're back up, folks. Uh, we're knocking on the door of when, uh, Monday's interday high. That was 29.37. We hit 29.36. Not much up here, folks. You had your, your glowback high on Monday, 29.47. Uh, your high close for this entire rebound has been 29.41. And maybe we'll even see 29.65 tonight. That's been the, or today, that's been the high of the move so far. Crude's helping out. That's up a buck twenty nine. I'm looking at the July at twenty six thirty six. Gold in the green by nine bucks at seventeen oh seven. Silver going the same way as well, up eleven cents at fifteen seventy nine. And Bitcoin gaining a little footing, up only fifty dollars though at eight thousand eight hundred and forty five. Uh, big having, I guess, takes place uh, tomorrow. Uh, let's bring in. Uh, Triple D, and uh, it's kind of like deja vu all over again here. Uh, buyers overnight. Yeah, same thing, same story. Groundhog Day. I feel like it is Groundhog Day. I do the same thing every day. I don't leave my house. Wake up, trade a bit, play with my kids, trade a little more, play with my kids, trade a little more, play with my kids, and go to bed. Groundhog Day around here. Groundhog Day in the markets, too, because same thing. Overnight little sell off. We got to buy the dip because we know the Fed's got the markets back. So when you got the Fed um, coming in here and they're going to buy, uh, obviously, bond ETFs, I yeah, believe, starting today. today. When you know you've got it, and think about this mentality there is mentality out there right now, and I can't even argue with it that if the markets pulls back, well, the Fed's just going to fire more bullets and drive it back higher anyway. So why would I not be long stocks? That is the bull argument. And you know what? It's a good one. Because we've seen again and again and again, if the market goes for a significant sell-off, the Fed will come in and do whatever they can to fire the market right back up again. So it is Groundhog Day around here. With all that being said, there's still a lot to worry about. I still stay with a lot of cash in my long-term portfolio. But as a trader, I continue to buy the dip and it continues to work. Yeah, surely, surely been working in the overnight sessions. I think this is, I don't know, the second, third, fourth day in a row uh, that you've had it. Last night was a pretty deep sell-off, though, and you see it down under 2,900, but uh, just a May, it's called the Fed bid. The Fed is bid at uh, 2,895 in the S&P futures, so until we take out the Fed at that level, I just wonder <laughs> what their target is. I wonder what their target is on the upside. Infinity but and beyond, Joel. <laughs> That's the target. That's the Fed target. All right. So um, and the having. What is this having or having or that's tonight? Bitcoin's gonna have had to have or have not. That is not <laughs> the question. They're going to have. <laughs> that's what they should have called it. <laughs> that is not the question. They are definitely going to have it is today. Uh it's it was it was yesterday. Oh, it was yesterday. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we've already was... halved. What's it doing? What's the price? What's the Bitcoin at? I know you just gave it to me, but I was actually. Uh, I'm just looking at the futures. It's 8,835. It had a little bit of a run up to, to, into it, uh, over 10,000, and now back. So I don't know. Maybe we'll dig if up. If we want to buy Bitcoin, 
Yes. But we don't want to open a coin, you know, uh, one of these accounts, you know, at these coin brokers like Coin Market or yes. what, what? What? What is the one that you used when you were buying coin, it? Coinbase. 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 There's still no real way to just go buy an ETF and buy it. Uh, uh, besides, uh, what you is can, the? You can buy yeah, the, GB, that... the GBTC. The GBTC, yeah. but then that trades with a huge premium, uh, to, to my understanding, to the normal Bitcoin price. Part but of me a... wants to buy, and you know, I if if I turn and I go buy Bitcoin, you know, that's probably the top because I've never bought Bitcoin before. I've talked about it. Part of me wants to buy it. Part of me just says that this is the kind of world that we're in right now that people are going to look for an alternative to this Fed inflationary pressure, and you know that narrative could just drive Bitcoin higher for a while. So, am I a believer that we're all going to be using cryptocurrency and the U.S. dollar is going to be worthless? Absolutely not. Could I see that you know narrative driving Bitcoin higher? The narrative that you know we just keep printing money and Bitcoin is you know not the infinite supply that the U.S. dollar apparently has. I, I can see that narrative, so I could see Bitcoin going back and rechallenging those twenty thousand. So part of me wants to go and buy it. If there was probably an easy ETF where it's just you know and it's trading at the you know the, the value of what the holdings are, I'd probably jump right in. But when I looked into that GBTC like six Huge months premium. ago. It was trading with a huge premium to their underlying holdings. Is that still the case for you crypto guys out there, guys and girls? Is the GBTC still trading at a huge premium to the Bitcoin price? Or is that the best way for me to play it without opening this uh, coin? I, now I forget again. What, what did you call it? Coinbase. Coinbase. Yeah, Coinbase. Uh, Dennis, the one thing, I'll, uh, you saw the news that Paul Tudor Jones said he has 2%, yeah. 2 of his assets in Bitcoin. And so I saw just... the guy interview on CNBC last night, and he says yeah. it's going a lot higher. I don't know who it was. <laughs> Obviously, no crypto bulls. And, and, we know, and we know Brian Kelly has been tooting the horn here, and he's saying Bitcoin. I heard him say 50000 the other night. So I don't know if it's doing that, but I could. you can see the bull case here. So at least, you know, in, we always say you can only trade on, on technicals. But right now, you can probably trade it just on an anti-inflationary to the U.S. dollar. And that makes me somewhat bullish Bitcoin. But I don't know. If I jump in and buy it, you know it's going to tank. I mean, it, I mean the, the concept is pretty simple, right? You're reducing the new supply of Bitcoin generated by the miners from 12.5 to 6.25 Bitcoin per block. And so there's a reduction. So you are reducing supply, right? Well, so mm, supply demand. Not I mean, really. I, no, no, you're not no? reducing, the, you're reducing the incentive. You're reducing the, the, the supply is still, is still the same. There's same. still the 21, reducing the incentive whatever, 21 million Bitcoin uh, or, or whatever the number is. Um, again, that's infinitely divisible, but uh, so, so supplies, which, which I've argued before, <laughs> means it's not actually limited supply when it's when you can divide and keep dividing and dividing and right. dividing and dividing. But, right. but I just the, I, the, the only reason I like it is the narrative. That's the, the narrative <laughs> right now that, you know, eventually people are looking at this and saying the U.S. just keeps printing money and printing money. And eventually, you know, the Mark Yusko argument and the, obviously Peter Schiff argument, although Peter Schiff is definitely not bullish Bitcoin from the last time I heard him. But. I mean, where is the, this ride stop? So I think, I think there will be investors looking for alternatives to investing in U.S. dollars that just keep getting printed. So I, I don't I could see the bull argument. That's all I'm saying. All let's right. get let's pivot away from Bitcoin and talk about no. just the start. I thought today, it was a Bitcoin show today, being this the start of the Fed bond ETF buying program. If you look at LQD, look at HYG, uh, just. HYG, I don't know if that was a fat finger or what. Uh, that that candle on my on my chart here at at 4 a.m. this morning, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Let's go uh, look. What did it do at 4 a.m., Joe? Um, I'm going to look at the. I'm going well, to look at the tail of the tape. But today is today is the day where the Fed will start buying uh, bond ETFs in the open market, and a lot of people have, have tried to front run this, and, but. It, they didn't actually buy anything yet. The Fed hasn't bought anything yet. So today is that day, uh, and it, I guess it's it's a bit of a of a turning point in in monetary policy history. They're going to the open market and buying bond ETFs. And then Becky Quick was saying yesterday on CNBC, or maybe it was it was the other day, that the precedent's set now. What's to stop them from buying stocks in the open market? I and, know. It's ridiculous. You know? Well, it's ridiculous. So uh -huh. 
Um, actually, the uh, the LQD didn't do much, but that HYG Just was a little bit of a fade. I don't 80, know. 80, 98, 700 shares. Somebody got excited and said, this is the day I got to buy HYG right on the 4 a.m. open, yeah. and you paid up too much. These bonds... Don't think these bonds are just going to start blasting off into orbit because the Fed's coming in and buying them right away. I mean, this is, you know, still trading from underlying holdings here. And the bonds move a lot less than the stocks. Like, you look at the movement in HYG over the course of the last two weeks and look at the movement of SPY. There is some correlation there, but bonds are obviously going to be linked with the TLT, too. Obviously, when you get corporate bonds, they got a little linkage to the stock market as well. But you can see that the volatility very muted compared to what the S&P has done in the same time. So bonds do not typically move as much as the stocks. So don't think HYG is just going to, or HYG or JNK or any of them are just going to blast off into orbit all of a sudden because the Fed's coming in and buying. That's all I'm saying. All right, we'll see how they respond today. S&P's uh, two ticks off the high of the session. Uh, do we want to talk uh, crazy mover stocks after hours? Or of course do you we talk do. To the... What do you okay. got for me? Talk talk to me. You're the one that's uh, uh, participating in the, uh, I guess. I thought you with... might have had something you were looking at specifically, though. There's always crazy movers after hours. And you know what? Holy cow, Jim Cramer, you are moving stocks like you've never moved them before. Take a look at Upwork. The CEO on CNBC last night, it did report earnings. And obviously, you know, it reports and then it didn't really do much. But then Jim Cramer tweeted out right after he tweeted before I was on the show. I don't have the tweet in front of me. Maybe you can go find it quickly, Spencer. But he tweeted basically something bullish about Upwork. And it started to go up immediately when he tweeted that. And then the CEO came on CNBC and um, the stock just kept going. So it's 12 bucks. I actually own Upwork. I bought this stock in my portfolio, believe it or not, about a week ago. Because I like the setup. It was kind of consolidating. It run up to $9, pulled back a little bit. I like the narrative that I thought, you know, this could be seen as a COVID play. So when it started going above 9 again, I was like, okay, I'm going to try for the breakout. I'm still long it right now. So, Mr. Alcon, you're going to have to tell me this is a huge pop now. Don't um, sell. I bought it at $9 Don't. a week ago. It's now $12. I am very good at entering trades. I've always been very poor at exiting. What's my exit strategy on this thing? Uh, 15 is like looks like a huge level i don't know if it's got the gas to get to 15 obviously not today but you know saying over the course of the next couple of weeks that the narrative continues to carry it i like i would i would be a seller at 15 i don't know if it can get there though uh just well look for you know uh follow through through the pre-market high of uh 1237 it's real close to that area right now uh but no, it's at 1197. So you did back off. So if you want a short term target that 1237, I'm just looking back in November, you had a bad day. You had a gap down day. Not sure what the reason was, but you got a gap between that was that was earnings, I believe. That was earnings. I mean, thir- between 1397 and 1497, you know, you talked about the 15. That's where the gap is there. So why I'd not? love to get 15 on this. I don't know if it's got the gas to get there. All these COVID plays. So, and this is, I think this is a COVID play too. We talked about this on the show. Did we not talk about this? Like we a did. Week ago? Like, I think we talked about this as a potential. I know we talked, I talked about it with you, Spencer. And I'm pretty sure we talked about it on the show. Dennis, um, just, you, Dennis you and I only talk on the show. <laughs> well, no. we talk a little bit right before we're <laughs> Wait, getting ready. Well, for when, the show. when else would we have talked we, about We this? talk about getting ready for the show, but I, I see it as a potential COVID play. And I think as, that, that's what's driving it from last night because that's kind of how it was getting pitched as, on Kramer. So I can see it. I mean, all of these COVID plays, let's just group them all together. The Pelotons, the Zooms, the TDOCs, they're all blasting off into orbit here once again, you know, and then you can go Shopify, Amazon. Mm-hmm. You know, Kramer's got that COVID index. And, you know, he did a dang good job creating that COVID index. Because I got to tell you, um, you know, those stocks, you know, that he's all talking about are, you know, the stocks that have all been moving. So anything to do with stay at home has still, even though despite that we're reopening. And that's the question I've got for the viewers and for you guys. Now that we are moving to reopening, is there a trade where, you know, all of a sudden the gaming stocks aren't as attractive? I mean, they had a great day again yesterday. I'm, I'm long all four. You know, I'm long Glue Mobile. I'm long, well, there's more than four, but I'm long Glue Mobile. And if you count Microsoft, I'm long five. I'm out I'm long the big three Activision, EI, Take Two. Long yeah. them all. I'm long Glue Mobile and I'm long Microsoft. Obviously, Microsoft isn't a pure gaming play, but the other ones are. 
is there time to ring the register in some of these things? I'm way up in almost all of them. Is it time to ring the register because we're reopening and maybe video games? Or is it a case where these things just work no matter what? Viewers and me. And and you guys. Well, I can tell you. I can tell you what Joel would say. Joel would say, "Well, why did you buy it in the first place?" I bought bought it because the narrative of everybody's locked up. Let them (laughs) take. Let them. And video games are going to be hot, which has worked. I bought Activision Blizzard. Well, I had bought it a long time ago, but I added to it around fifty four or fifty five dollars. So it's seventy five, and I literally bought it in March. So I'm up in a month and a half. I'm up almost forty percent in that position. Take two, I had already. EA, I just bought on the earnings dip. Glue Mobile, I just bought recently. We know that. I talked about on the show around, I think it was eight bucks or something. I can't even remember. And then Microsoft, I bought on the dip too. Microsoft's a different story. I think it works as the market works. But right, there right. could be a trade eventually where some money that is hiding out in all of these stocks could come off. I don't know if that's today. I don't, I'm not saying it's going to be imminent. I'm just saying if we're reopening, you could see some rotation. Yeah, but the somebody's... reason, but the, this yeah. this is the this is the reason that's a dangerous premise is because well, there's no promises in trading. Yeah, uh, premise. I said premise. Oh, premise. Sorry. Yes. Um, what happens if reopening doesn't go well? Exactly. I don't yeah. think it's gonna go well. I okay. think it's gonna go well for a couple of weeks. It's like, oh yeah, we're going to our restaurants. You see that? Did you see that picture of that restaurant in Colorado, Spencer, on Twitter? That had the uh, Day. Yes, they have. They been were shut. packed, man. They, they've been shut down. Oh, they got to shut them down for that. Yeah, they were just packed. Like people are in there. Nobody's wearing masks. They're packed in there like sardines. They said it was one of their busiest days ever. And I'm like, is this for real? My, like, I tell you, I wouldn't be in there. But I, obviously, I'm on the other. You know, there's people who believe that this is just a flu, and you know why we were so worried about it. So there's obviously those two opinions. We're not going to get into that. But nope. if people start going back out. And the restaurants start. I mean, is there going to be another dash for trash for a couple of weeks? I do believe, and this is my opinion and what you were saying too, is eventually I think that this starts to spread rapidly again. And we have to do some type of social distancing measures in a more, you know, in a, in a way that we were doing it back in March. I think we're going to go right back into our lockdown, to, to be honest with you, in a month or two, because I think it's going to start spreading again. That's my opinion. But I can also see a few weeks here where, Oh, it looks pretty good, you know. And I think this could push the Dow above, you know, or the S P above three thousand. I think it could drive, you know, some of these other stocks that you know have been really beat up that can't seem to catch a bed. I don't know. The rotation's incredible in the market day to day. I mean, yesterday the banks were still getting killed despite the market being significantly higher. So, getting ahead of the rotation has always been a way to make some pretty good money. What are your thoughts out there? Well, Let them I'll take I, you out I, on the way down. Let them well, take you out on the way down. I would well, say why, real why quick. try to call the top, just let her just let her ride for a little bit. And then if we get an ugly candle, then try to pop it up after that. Yep. Well, I would say, and Spinner kind of stole my thought here, but uh, if Spinner, you, stop stealing thoughts. But, but if, if you go, if you go look at Upwork since the IPO, uh, it's been a bit of a, a dog. And so I, I'm not sure I'd want to hide out in a, it's one thing. If, if Which you're, stock are you talking? Upwork. 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 So, it, like, it's one thing if you want to hide out in like uh, in Activision or an EA, uh, and, and yeah. you're a, and you're playing, you know, a secular trend in, in gaming. But to uh, to to hide out in a stock like Upwork that with with a year of price history, uh, a, a new company uh, went public at a high valuation uh, off of uh, a good, what is essentially one, there's good risk, report, one good earnings report and some, some love from Jim Cramer. There's risk. Yeah. There's, there's, risk. There's, there's more risk in a name like that than in a name like Activision or EA. So, yeah. So That's, interesting. I mean, and obviously some of these stocks that I've got on right now are not like long-term core positions. Like I could make Microsoft a long-term core position and be comfortable making Microsoft a long-term core position. Right. Are, are you going to make Upwork? You're going to make an Upwork no, core position? No, exactly. this was a trade. This was, this was, you know, I threw it in the long-term account so I didn't trade out of it right away, but it was designated when I went there a swing trade. Meaning I think the narrative is going to continue to carry it. It has worked. I mean, it's when I bought it at $9, I think 20 cents. Four or five days, not even, like three or four days ago. And obviously, I had no idea it was going to come on Kramer, so that helped a lot. But I did know that they were going to report, so I was kind of anticipating maybe a couple-day earnings run up. But then I heard they're going to be on Kramer, so I've held. 
And now it's up significant, another 10%, obviously off the highs here. And you think, uh, maybe it's time to ring the register here when you make 25% on a stock or 30% on a stock in four days. So, I mean, that, you know, and obviously, you know, that's been the case with a lot of these stocks. You just think, you know, um, of the movement that we've had in some of these issues, it's been incredible. Like, that's why I rang the register on Shopify, which was a mistake. I mean, I sold my Shopify. I actually timed it pretty well, but I just didn't rebuy when we have only one day to rebuy it. But Shopify is $767 here today. And I said the other day, I feel like it's going to go without me. Well, it is. I mean, it seems like once the ball gets going, it keeps going. And, you know, who cares? Valuation doesn't matter at all on Shopify at this point in time. It's got a story and a narrative, and that could continue to carry it. So I don't know if Upwork's going to continue. Obviously not to the nature of Shopify, but the narrative is, gonna, is carrying it today. Well, what a t- another thing, too, that uh, when, you know, if you're not playing a stock on earnings day, it's always interesting to see what that earnings day close is, right? Because if there's a gap up, if there's movement, and a lot of times you have you have the gap up after earnings, it holds, you know, consolidates for a day or two, and then boom, another leg higher. So let's see what the closing price is today. 1167, we backed off the pre-market high. You have been up uh, one, two, three, four. It looks like six days in a row. So see what that closing price is today. And not, not necessarily the high, not necessarily the low, because people are working out at the mark. And if there's someone that, you know, long under $6, 12 was their target. They got 2 million shares. I mean, they're not going to put a 2 million share offer out there and get it done. You know, they're going to let it get up to 1210 and then hit it with a couple thousand and then wait again. And then, you know, so those kind of things. So, you know, just wait, let's sit. I, I, I would base it. You're going to have a gap up today. Let's see what the closing price is today. A little bit of consolidation. It's a ride it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, at this point, I mean, you know, you're in it. I mean, what's the all time high in it? I mean, how many times have you just seen these stocks just, just go? And go and go and go yeah. and go yeah. instead of yeah. trying to pick the top in it. But um, we cannot move on. We got some earnings, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, Simon Property Group up six sticks here. Uh, I guess we're going to incorporate. It was only closed for the last couple of weeks of the quarter. How was their report, Spencer? And the CEO, I believe, also said Boy, that Mac they're trying to, or that they 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 want to reopen some malls sooner than expected. So maybe that's part of it here. But uh, the the earnings, I mean, they were horrible on on a year over year basis, as, as you would expect. Let me see if I can pull up the numbers here compared to the estimates. One second. SPG. I mean, one thing about malls you got to take into consideration is they're pretty darn big, right? So, when, yeah. like when you're walking around, you're really not even that close to people going in the individual stores and stuff. But they, you know, don't know if you want to, you know, make it a, a, a daily practice or whatever. But there is room that, you know, navigate that as, a, as opposed to like an Apple store. You know, where they're, you know, you're in there like sardines, but go ahead with the report. Yeah, the EPS, they made a $2.78 per share uh, last quarter. I don't see an estimate, and the revenue was higher. Uh, 1.35 billion versus 1.29 billion on the estimate there. But again, uh, I think it really is. This is from the CEO who's saying that they want to reopen them all sooner, sooner than expected. It's a huge pop. The stock had been in the gutter. It's still. You know, am I coming and buying SPG up 11%? It's been one of the dogs of the group. I mean, look at what the S&P has done in the last two right. months. And look at what Simon Property has done. The relative strength on this thing has been terrible. So, you know, again, with that being said, things can have wicked rallies. So I'm not going to short it here either, but I'm not going to chase something, buy it up 11% when every time you've bought this thing up 11%, two weeks or a week later, you've been punished for it. So is this going to be another case? You know, it's definitely got room up to the high of the move, which is 72.58. It's 10 points higher. So it's room. That's why it's in the middle of nowhere for me. I just can't even see it. I see a setup here. This is like, you know, a slider. Try, try to hit this pitch. It's going to be real <laughs> tough, man. Real interesting area here. Uh, you had um, on a day that it hit 66.28. That was May 5th. That might just been a rip-roaring day in the market. Uh, it reversed course and made a low at 60.09 and closed at 60.55. Uh, the following day, the high was 61.86. We're right there right now. So if this thing can get up over 62, hold 62, I can honestly tell you, there's not a lot in there for a few bucks. I don't know if you're going to get all the way to 66, uh, 28, but right now, you know, the pre-market looks, looks bid there. They're at the highs of the pre-market session. 
Uh, so you're getting into an area where if it can get up and hold, not sure what the short interest is in uh, in this one, but that's just a really tough area above 62, between 62 and uh, 66.28. If we start to fall back, trying to pick this up, you'll have to drill down on one of your shorter term charts. But uh, that's what I'm looking at here as a possible setup in uh, in SPG. A lot of questions about uh, DraftKings, DK, and G. I guess yeah. uh, Soros went into that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, trading up again, two twenty-seven. I mean, I tried to buy it on the Soros headline last night, but it whipped really fast up there. And there was, you know, unless you paid up a buck, and it would have worked. Obviously, because it's up two bucks now, it was you know tough, tough buy. But I, I don't totally, you know, get the love for DraftKings at this point in time. But I guess, you know, we're anticipating that sports are coming back here and it's going to be bigger and better than ever. So the longer term play is what you're obviously buying it for because it's difficult to, you know, sports betting when you don't have sports. This is yeah, not but people this, are going to bet on anything, man. What, what's gonna, that, Spencer? Yeah, this is not a short term play. This, I, I, unless you're buying the pop up this morning. But this is, this is, the, I, I think people for most, are betting on sports. Right. I, I love sports. I want sports back. Trump has said he wants sports back. We want sports back. In whatever way we can, I'm hungry for sports. I was tempted to buy that UFC fight. I'm not even a UFC fan, but I was very tempted to buy. My dad loves UFC. Um, you know, I, I, I can appreciate it, but right now I'm just hungry for anything. And, you know, and obviously I went and watched the highlights of it and they're pretty awesome. But it's it's so tough, you know, in a lockdown to be in the situation that we currently are and then to be a huge sports fan like many people are and not be able to watch anything, any sports. I mean, if I had a, uh, no, and they're talking about baseball getting back July 4th, that'd be something. I mean, I, I still want to see the NHL playoffs somehow. I don't know if that's going to happen, but uh, I'm, that, that a, seems the AHL that seems killed their whole season yesterday. So yeah. um, American Hockey League season's dead. They killed it. I hope the NHL doesn't do it. I hope the NBA can somehow find a way to play the games, You know, uh, even if it's a shortened playoffs. But if we're getting baseball back. You know, may, maybe there's a shot still that we could play on. I mean, it's not impossible to play hockey in the summer. It's still, they can still keep ice in, but Correct. We're, starting to, we're starting to run out of time. Uh, I mean, I mean it, Dennis, if you just look at like the, the NHL playoffs, they last year they began on April 10th. I mean, we are yeah. way, we are way past that. Yeah. I did it, have a tough. vendetta. I did have a vendetta against uh, DK, DKNG because of a, uh, um, uh, a sports wagering uh, company that I was involved in way before my time. You, know, way you were trying to get into that. You were trying to be the draft Kings decades ago. You were way ahead of it. Yeah. Way, 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 way too. it. Now we basically had uh, like you have trading software to trade stocks. We designed software to trade games intra game, like with the spread, without the spread, who's the winner. Uh, but uh, well, then the it, laws changed. Yeah, we shut her down in one day. No, we had, we had several subscribers. So, anyways, I was, I was, it was a vendetta stock. But now I'm like, hey, you know, go with the flow in this one. I see it trading up. I see a pair of lows at 23. So, if you're riding this one, you know, let's see it, let it break 23 on you. But uh, the trend is your friend. Jar Jar says they added horse racing. You know, as much as I love, you know, all the sports and stuff, you guys know I'm a horse racing fan. Missed the Kentucky Derby so far this year. Yeah. I mean, horse racing, I mean, they ran the Arkansas Derby. They ran a couple heats. I actually saw it on two different TV channels. So who knows? You know, maybe uh, maybe horse racing can make a comeback. People are willing to uh, to wager on anything. I have a hard time. I just can't wager on a screen. And I need my program. I need to look at the horses coming out of the paddock. I just So not for me, but definitely, definitely for Joel people. needs the edge. And yeah, you know, see, there's a couple things that you can see, like I can't reveal here. Um, so much that Alan has been very patient. He's asked about the XBI 14 times. Now, unbelievable moves. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 there's two sectors that are driving the market: biotech, and and I guess it's tech and tech. Biotech, tech. tech. It, as long as it's, if it says tech, it is pretty much hot. <laughs> so you got XBI making new all-time highs yesterday, and not even in a little way, like a breakout of breakouts. So I've got a position on in LabU, 
which is obviously leveraged XBI, and I've got the XBI on too. So I do have positions on in here just for full disclosure. Sure. Uh, bias to the long side here, just overnight trading, because I figured there could be some follow through. There is being some follow through here this morning. We'll be selling those trades at the open. Um, but, you know, so that's just my thoughts. But I mean, on this ETFs, biotech's hot. Should we be, uh, become pre-market prep tech and like change the name instead of the pre-market prep show, pre-market prep tech, and then we'll just uh, we'll just explode. Uh, this one, a big candle yesterday, follow through today. So I would just keeps making new closing highs for the move, and so just keep an eye on that. Yesterday's close was uh, one hundred four thirty two. You're trading at one hundred five fifty. Give yourself for, you know, see if you make a new uh, close, you know, closing high for the move. But man, what a strong move from this thing. Went from $65 up to $62.94. Yeah. It just, uh, yeah, I just really the only relevant number there is that close from yesterday. We've just had some incredible movement here. And obviously you can look at the IBB as well. So, you know, and it ripped into new, I believe that's new all time highs for the IBB too. So we're actually have gotten, finally gotten back to the 2015 highs wow. when we made those and we've taken them out, I believe yesterday for the first time. So five years later, after having that ridiculous biotech run back in 2013, 2014, 2015, we've been consolidation station for five years. We've now broken out. And obviously we know the reason. I mean, it's been in focus. People are still going to need their drugs despite, you know, even if we're in a recession or depression. But not only that, a lot of these companies are working on stuff to do with COVID. And there's been underlying demand for the stocks because of that. So, you know, we've seen Gilead, you know, ripping higher on different, you know, news. And obviously we've seen a lot of the other stocks. You know, Moderna, we haven't talked about here today, but it's ripping higher here again. Obviously, smaller play, but a vaccine play. There is just, you know, this narrative here is still hot. Uh, CPI comes in uh, pretty much at estimates. The uh, food and energy down 4% versus estimates are down 2%. Took a little luster off there, uh, 29, 28, 50. Uh, we backed off the highs of the pre-market session. So not in love here with uh, with the CPI. Real good number now you got up top. Your, your high, your overnight high, 36. Your interday high, 37. Uh, good number up there to see if we can get back up, make a new uh, closing high for the move. Uh, all right, it's 834. Let's bring on our guest here just a couple seconds early. Craig Earlham, he's the senior market strategist at Oanda. He will be joining us by, uh, by phone from across the pond, uh, I believe. And uh, let's, uh, let's bring Craig on here and he can give us his thoughts, his macro thoughts, his micro thoughts. Craig, good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? We're hanging in there, Craig. What's what's it like over by you? How's that, how's the sentiment? How how are people feeling? Are people about ready to, to to jump out the window and go to work or what? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's all anyone's talking about right now. When can I leave my house? Uh, when can I get back to work? You never think you hear the sentiment. When can I get back to work? But that's very much what people are thinking right now. Um, I mean, I guess plenty of people you speak to as well as when can I go back to the pub? But I mean, I think um, I think work is first and foremost on that list. Um, yeah, I, I no, I was going to say on the hierarchy, it probably goes pub then work, right? Yeah, for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think people just miss the social, the, the socializing aspect. I think even with work, I think people miss the office because they get to actually see some new faces, have a bit of a laugh. Like um, this is this is part of who we are. So, yeah, I mean, I think people are looking forward to life returning to normal. Hopefully we're obviously seeing some early steps now with lockdown measures being ever so slightly eased. But obviously there's still a lot of apprehension. I mean, I'm sat here in London. My only way into work is the is the tube. I'm not looking forward uh, to getting back to that again. Um, and I don't think I'm going to particularly any t uh, in, in the near term. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of nervous people out there right now, and we're just hoping that any second wave that comes is going to be relatively mild and people's confidence can grow from there. Yeah. So what has surprised you most uh, just across the board here uh, with regards to the the reaction in, in various markets here to the virus and the recovery we've had in the past month or, or in the past month and change? What about this recovery has surprised you the most? 
Well, in terms of in the markets, the thing that's almost surprised me most, and it shouldn't surprise me because it always seems to, but the thing that surprised me most is the fact that people seem to be all too willing to um, to almost envisage the future already that is beyond the virus. It's kind of life returning to normal. We look at where stock markets are right now, and granted, we do have unprecedented amounts of monetary stimulus. We have enormous fiscal stimulus plans, but the, the road ahead is still incredibly uncertain. Uh, the We've seen already now signs of second waves uh, of the coronavirus in South Korea, China, even Germany. Uh, and while they are still small, that's how these things begin again. So the, there is the very real prospect that, thing, that the lockdown will have to be restricted uh, further again at some point in the future. Uh, and that just that level of uncertainty, I don't think uh, I don't think we're seeing that necessarily in the markets at the moment. That said, um, the, 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 the old adage goes, uh, the markets can be irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And I, I feel like that's been repeatedly been the case ever since central banks started uh, print, printing uh, enormous trillions uh, of dollars, euros, pounds, whatever. Um, and therefore, it, it, it's it's hard to necessarily argue with the markets, but it has surprised me just how quickly uh, they have bounced back and where they continue to stand um, uh, because... Like I say, the the outlook for the rest of this year in particular is extremely uncertain. And while we may not know how much of the current data that we're seeing is permanent and how much of it is just almost clouded by the furlough schemes, uh, I think the, there is going to be a, a high level of unemployment still, and that is going to have a knock-on effect. What about this headline here this morning that the Bank of England could go negative with their rates? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm a massive, massive negative rate skeptic, if I'm perfectly honest. We, we, we for years talked about what the ECB can do about whether they can go negative further by another 0.1 of a percentage point. And you, you just got to question how effective that possibly is compared to some of the other schemes that they put in place. Even if the Bank of England goes negative, and let's not forget that for the past 12 years, we've been hearing from a central bank that said we can't go negative. Even going to zero is very, is risky. Going negative um, could create uh, issues within in terms of financial stability. So even if the central bank did go negative, you'd be talking like the Bank of Japan has 0.1%. How is that any more effective than a number of other schemes that we've seen, whether that be from the ECB with the likes of TLTROs, maybe from the Bank of England with the term funding scheme, even looking at the Bank of Japan, for example, with its um, yield curve uh, management uh, style, something like that, I think, is far more effective than than dipping into negative territory and risk uh, and the risks that come with that. I don't think that actually incentivizes banks in the way that it's intended to, unless you go extremely negative. And then, again, what what are the negative consequences that we're going to have to deal with as a result of that? Let's talk about oil here, Craig. Uh, the June uh, contracts expire a week from today. And it doesn't seem like we're going to see uh, a repeat of last month. And maybe we will. It's maybe too soon to tell. I think it's too soon to tell. I, I mean, obviously, you compare it now to a month ago, and a lot has changed over the last month. We've um, we've obviously had the OPEC Plus cuts kick in. We've had um, numerous uh, shale firms in the US who have uh, who are effectively leaving oil in the ground. Some are just cutting production. Uh, we've had some run into financial difficulty. We've had companies like ConocoPhillips who are actually committing to production cuts. Norway has cut, I think, two hundred fifty thousand barrels a day, uh, and there's other examples of that. Uh, around the world as well. Uh, Saudi Arabia now committing to additional cuts. So this is where the environment and the landscape has changed over the course of the last month. But we are still in a situation where the the supply-demand dynamic is not balanced. We're still in a situation uh, in which we are near capacity and we may not be getting there as quickly, but we are still near capacity. The interesting thing is a month ago, the panic kicked in on the Monday uh, with the Tuesday contract expiry. So it, we may see it a little bit earlier this time. People have uh, people will remember very much what happened last month and may start to get nervous later on this week. But it was only 24 hours before the contract expired that things got um, out of control this time last month. So uh, until um, until next Wednesday, I don't think uh, I think we'll we'll know a lot more about where the oil market really stands right now and how confident traders are. Yeah, so definitely keep it on your. The, the point is keep it on your screen. It's, oh, absolutely. It, yeah, yeah. It's, okay. one of, it's it's the main chart on my screen at all times at the minute. Oh, okay, so aside from oil, what what else are are you are, are you most closely watching right now? Like what area of the market? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a few different areas, obviously. I mean, unfortunately, gold right now is just incredibly dull. It seems to just be hovering around that $1,700 level and doesn't really seem to be shifting. Little intraday swings along the way, but it seems that we are just consolidating around that level. I don't think it helps the fact that the dollar, for example, is is range-bound as well, and that's been such a massive driver uh, with regards to uh, gold uh, uh, over the course of the last few months. So maybe when we see a breakout in one, it could lead the other or vice versa. So that could become a bit more interesting, but right now, like I say, very much in consolidation mode. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, you look at, um, uh, at the, the the dollar that you can you look at the pound versus the dollar. Um, the pound obviously came under considerable pressure in the aftermath of uh, 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 of the COVID crisis. The UK now faces a double whammy uh, risk uh, in terms of what the sharpest uh, risk, uh, contraction that we will have seen in three hundred years combined with the risk of still a no-deal Brexit at the end of this year. I remember once when the latter was seen as a huge economic risk, combined the two, uh, and I'm not surprised that we are seeing the pound act more like a risk currency at the minute. Yeah, actually, uh, before we go, I want to ask you about that. I, I admit I, I haven't been keeping up with my Brexit headlines of late. What, what, what is the latest there? Um, there, there is an enormous amount of latest, to be honest. It has fallen okay. out the headlines a little bit. There are negotiations already underway between the UK and the EU. I think there's been three virtual meetings thus far. Until now, the UK government has very much held the, held the line of we have it in law now that we are exiting at the end of this year with or without a deal without, uh, without, after the transitional period. There was reports that they may consider an extension for obvious reasons, uh, but the UK government until now has said we, are not, we will not request an extension. And what's more, if the EU offers one, we will say no. I think that's obviously a negotiating ploy. They do want some urgency in this, and they've admitted before that they believe you need a deadline in order to create the urgency which actually gets these deals done. So that's not to say that if we're in November and we don't have a deal, they're going to accept no deal. But I think until then, we're not going to hear any sounds from them that suggest that they are willing to accept any extension. So this uncertainty is going to continue. And don't you wish we could go back to the to the days of Brexit and trade wars and how good we had it? We had no idea. How good I came we into it. 2020 very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, me too, Craig. Me too. All right. Uh, Craig Earlham is a senior market analyst at Oanda joining us uh, via phone. Craig, thanks so much uh, for the time and be safe out there. You too. Cheers, guys. All right. Um, let's, let's get back here to the stocks. It's 843. You got about 15 or so minutes left in our show. Uh, actually, you know what I want to do? Let's go to the financials here. We talked about this on the pre-market show. Tech has been the leader, and the financials or the banks have been the laggards here. Yeah. I mean, the, the banks are telling a completely different story, and the rotation like we've been talking about in this market has been absolutely nothing short of incredible. Money is just hungry for tech. I mean, you got Apple approaching all-time highs. You've got Google ripping higher there in the last couple of – or for the last – really a couple of months it's the lows amazon's not too far from all-time highs netflix is not too far from all-time highs microsoft is not too far from all-time highs facebook is not too far from all-time highs it's incredible to think about when you look at the opposite side and that's the banks and obviously we know oil's been an issue but wells fargo let's just bring this up and it just cannot catch a bit yes it is up uh 22 cents here this morning but Every single day, it's like Groundhog Day for Wells Fargo. Market goes up, Wells Fargo goes down. Market goes down, Wells Fargo goes down. WFC is now making a 10-year low. Yes, that is correct. If you go back, it is now we're at 2011 levels going back to the European financial crisis when they started hitting the U.S. banks as well. Telling a completely different story than what we are seeing in the NASDAQ, what you're seeing, you know, in a lot of different stocks. The yield on Wells Fargo WFC is now 8.16%. So just buying common stock, if you think the dividend is safe, you're getting 8% in the common stock. That is absolutely incredible. I don't know what to say. I mean, part of me thinks, you know, that, hey, you know, this is pretty good price here on a huge bank. Obviously, they've had the issues. You could say worst of breed. But then the other part of me says, What's going on? Well, we got a lot of bankruptcies coming their way. We've got, you know, oil issues. We've got a lot of, you know, other th issues. The bank is not open. They're definitely not doing probably a lot of corporate deals right now, besides maybe loaning bit money to businesses that need up and uh, uh, need money like a bailout. 
So it's tough. It's a tough banking environment right now. But, you know, you look at Bank America, you look at JP Morgan, Wells Fargo is telling, you know, even a different story than them. It has just been the underperformer of underperformers, the dogs of dogs. What's going on with the banks? Why are they not participating? I pose this to you guys. Because the lesson we learned in 08, 09 was you can look at all the balance sheets and statements that you want, but you will never know what kind of exposure the bank has. You just won't know. I mean, how big was the uh, the, the mortgage-backed securities team at, at Lehman Brothers, right? It's probably not that big. Yeah, and when they, you start and, getting into the derivative and, and, products. And they brought down the entire company, Yeah. right? So you yeah. just you will never know where the bank has exposure. So. Well, AIG was the you know insurance, and it was I believe a unit out of Boston with thirty people. Yeah, same yeah, thing. thirty, and, and 30 they, people brought. And, and brought they, the you company. know, here's a company with a hundred thousand employees and thirty people taking you know, exotic risks on you yeah. know insuring mortgage backed securities and, and whatever else they were insuring. You know, I don't, can't remember the details now. It's been quite a few years later yeah. here, but I think it was thirty guys out of Boston and. And or people out of Boston, not necessarily guys, and obviously, um, you know that basically brought down AIG. So um, I don't know what's happening with Wells. I don't know what's happening with the banks overall. The banks really haven't participated. It hasn't been good. It kind of makes sense though. Like the banks are telling the story of logic. The tax and the other things are telling the story of FOMO. So there's two different stories being told depending on which sectors you are. There's the story of the airlines and the stories of the, you know, the cruise lines and the stories of the stuff that's right in ground zero for this, for the COVID and for the lockdown. And then there's the story of FOMO missing out in the text that just they just keep ripping no matter what. So the rotation has been absolutely incredible. If that rotation starts to reverse. It'll be a wicked trade the other way. I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know when that's going to happen. Eventually, probably it does to a certain extent. But I'm not backing up the truck and buying Wells Fargo here because it's pricing like they're going to have problems. And that is scary, not just for Wells Fargo, but that is scary for stocks overall. Because I've said through this whole thing is financial crisis part two is not off the table. And every day that the banks go down makes me think that there is still possibilities that despite, you know, the NASDAQ and Apple and, you know, some of these tech rich companies, cash rich, which we've said we've liked. I own Apple. We've liked those companies because they're cash rich. There is still some major issues out here. Or well, do you have any thoughts? All right, Joel, you're on mute. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't have Joel, any thoughts. Joel, I just put him to sleep. Yeah. No, 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 no. I was on mute during that interview. Did a great job with uh, Craig there. Um, what's Mr. Buffett doing with uh, with? He owns Wells, his... doesn't he? Yeah. He owns a lot of banks, I thought. What's yeah. he got? Let's go look at the Berkshire. Bring it up. Can we bring it up uh, uh, and, and show it? Yeah, Spencer? one second. Let's yes, bring we, the yes, Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. Show it. Give me 10 seconds to grab it. He's going to grab it. We're going to look at what is inside Berkshire Hathaway. And we know there's a lot of cash sitting inside it that he's not putting to work. But right, Berkshire Hathaway Holdings. Here we go. I'm trying pull to look up. at it at the same time you are. Pull up the Benzinga Pro. It's nice. You can get this right inside the Pro here, too. Here we go. Got it up. Let's share my screen. Share the screen. And We're going to take a look go. at what's inside Berkshire Hathaway. All right. Here we go. Berkshire Hathaway. This is their fund sorted by position size the pro's got a lot of cool information so we've okay. got yeah, let me close out the chat there okay so we've got just tell us how to do that because there's people who subscribe sure, to pro sure, what sure. are the what are the mechanics i'll do sure. it right along with you so all i did so if you if you're on your your home page of pro whatever your your, yep. your default but you go you go to the details widget we call them widgets so you details details and you just search for Berkshire Hathaway. Now there's a lot of Berkshire. There's a few from Berkshire Hathaways, right? There's the there's the stock. There's the common stock. Uh, there is the class A. I think there's a class B, and then there's the fund. You want to you want to go to the fund. We want to go to the fund. Right. Berkshire Hathaway. Gotcha. Yep. I'm and in that. There. And that is that's it. That's that's the trick. So we're in. We're looking at the holdings of Berkshire Hathaway right now. And uh, yeah, let's see. They own. He owns Bank America. He owns Wells. He owns wow. U.S. Bancorp. He owns uh, American Express. BMW, and if you're looking uh, why Delta, and if you stop and you look why why Delta's still in there, because we haven't had the official release, right, right, of from from the thirteen from thirteen K or thirteen F thirteen F, which by the way is, ne- is next week. So we haven't had the official release. So we're, you're still going to see Delta Holdings, even though we know he sold them because he said he sold them. 
but we based when we were building this, it has to be based on the 13Fs. And as of the last 13F, he still owned a significant amount of Delta. Right. That's why you we see know the, that is gone because that's, he said that's it. why you see Southwest there exactly. So the 13Fs, yeah. 13Fs come out and they're they're due uh, by next Friday, the 15th. So this will be updated by then. But yeah, it's based on the the the, the federal filings. So his Apple position, which is huge, because probably it continues to go up. So it's probably just a matter of you know the stock has outperformed a lot of the other ones. Why it's gotten so big is still a significant portion of his fund, like like huge, uh, 55 billion. So it's by far his biggest holding. Then there's Coca-Cola and then American Express. You know, and these Coke and American Express have not been great. Uh, Bank America has not been good at all. Kraft Heinz has been a disaster, although it's come back in the last month. Wells Fargo's number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it looks like. So fifth, six. Six, yeah. number six, 164 million shares worth $8 billion. Obviously, that's went down significantly here, too. So it'll be interesting to see. But you're right. He holds a lot of banks. He's got Bank America, USB. He's got, he's got, oh, JP, not he's even got that. JP Morgan. He's got, he's got a he's lot got, of banks. He's got a ton of them in there. Yeah, you don't know his cost basis in these things, too. Of course I mean, not. They're down. They're down. But You I could mean, probably they... get that from Berkshire Hathaway's site, I would think. Yeah. You know, yep. he's going to have to release that in his quarterly reports where the cost basis is. So you could get that information. We don't have it in there. But, um, you know, Wells Fargo, obviously, it's 11, 10-year low on the stock, so it's not great. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. I mean, he's loaded up with banks. He's loaded. You can see he's a value guy. So this is lower, lower PE stuff. It hasn't performed very well. Shockingly enough, the Berkshire Hathaway in itself, Burke.B, well, it hasn't performed well either in the last month. So you can see this clear rotation, uh, even in Berkshire Hathaway stock, Burke.B, from growth, from value to growth. And value has significantly underperformed, and so has Berkshire Hathaway. So we know rotations happen, and we know eventually maybe value comes back into favor. But value has been out of favor for a long time. It isn't like value has been out of favor for a few weeks or a few months. I feel like value has been out of favor for years. I so, would argue decades. Even, yeah. <laughs> so, and if you look, you know, where is Berkshire Hathaway? Well, $174. Back at the peaks in 2015, it was 152 So really, the return over the last five years has not been great. Obviously, it has been fantastic if you've been invested in anything to do with tech. In that time, the NASDAQ has more than doubled. So... He's put some tech stocks. Apple's helped him tremendously, obviously. But the value-oriented approach here has not been the best oh, approach in the last yep. 10 years. All right. Uh, I feel like I'm saying, I've said this sentence a thousand times before, but Tesla's popping this morning again, guys. Well, well, on what now? Because they're going to reopen? Is that they, why it's they, popping? They, they, are, they are open. Yeah, they're, they, they're open. They are, so, they're, and if you weren't following the story... I, I, do you have the story in front of you? Because um, I, I can butcher yeah, it. Yeah, well, want. the story is that, Elon, uh, the <laughs> the county told Tesla, you cannot open your Fremont factory. Elon said, nah, we're going to do it anyway. And that's basically <laughs> the story. <laughs> they opened anyway, even though they were told not to do it. And so now the story is not over. He was tweeting, like, if you're going to arrest somebody, arrest me. I don't know what's going to happen. Is this not incredible? It's, like, this this guy... It's just from another world. Like maybe that's why he, he wants to die on Mars because maybe he's from Mars. I mean, here he is. The county said you cannot open, and he says I'm doing it anyways. We're open. Come arrest me. What? Seriously? I, I don't know. I'd be surprised. Just if arrest get arrested. him. He doesn't want anybody else arrested. Yeah, he doesn't want any of his employees arrested. Either way, why? I mean, I guess, you know, he's desperate to get, you know, production going here and he doesn't believe in obviously the lockdown. He's voiced that opinion tremendously, but he's risking going to jail to make a point and obviously to, to make cars. <laughs> so I, I just find it incredible the stuff that this guy does. Like, you know, he is, you know, just a story in himself. <laughs> I know that's what makes it so interesting. Yeah, it really is. Is, is, is there's two stories here. There's, there, there's Tesla, there's three stories. There's Tesla, the company, Tesla, the stock, and Tesla CEO. So three stories born into one. I had a pair of highs uh, from Friday and Monday at 824. We've cleared that trading 830 up 1871. So use that 824 um, as support now since you are trading above it. Only number I can give you on the upside though is 869.82. And I believe that was earnings day. Uh, for Tesla when it hit that level. I'm not sure if it's earnings day or an upgrade, but uh, holding 824 important and 
Nothing up to 869.82. A lot of air in there, uh, but we'll see. Trading right at the highs of the pre market session, uh, trading up uh, nearly $19 at 829.80. It's such a poster child stock for this market that just has to have growth tech in whatever possible way they can. Fundamentals matter nothing. CEO Musk comes out a week ago and says when Tesla's trading around $800 or $780 that he thinks his stock is overvalued. I've never seen that in my life. A CEO comes out and says their stock is too high, but the stock tanks on it. Two days later, it gets the losses back. back. Five days later, we're making new highs again. The market just does not care about any fundamental information. It has to buy growth tech no matter what. This will end ugly. All of this will end ugly somehow, but I don't know when. And I guess you just keep riding the ride, the, you know, the, the riding the ride here until it's over. So I'm not shorting any of these stocks because we see what happens. I mean, I, I, and I, and I get, you know, and you immediately have seller's remorse when you sell the one that you're in. That's why I was like asking you guys on the Upwork here because Shopify, I screwed up. I had this stock. I said I wanted to be invested in it for the long run. It went up 100% in three weeks, and I said, that's too much too fast. I'm going to sell it and rebuy it. Now it's 100 points higher from where I, 120 points higher from where I sold it because up another 20 points today, and it's gone without me. So I'm punished for trying to put a value thought into a growth tech name. I guess you just buy growth tech and you hold on and you... You know, I don't, I don't know how the, when the what the exit strategy is on some of the stuff though. <laughs> I, like, oh, wow. I, like, like if you're long Tesla, I guess you're long it. But I, well, like maybe we're gonna know when, when, when it turns. Like they're all gonna turn together. But holy mackerel, I mean, just the buyers, the underneath demand for anything. And you know, this Tesla, the technicals. Talk about the technicals on this chart. It's setting up like it looks to me. This looks like it's ready to go to nine hundred bucks. Does it not look ready to break out again? Uh, I mean, like I said, there's nothing between here and that that high on uh, earnings day, um, 869.82. So holding 824, uh, it's going. Uh, quick question here on Smile Direct Club here. And uh, boy, has this stock really turned it around. Uh, got that news about uh, some partnerships with insurers last week. That gave it a boost. It consolidated for a couple of days, trading up again here for talking about SDC, Smile Direct Club, uh, trading up on, some, they're trading some shares in this thing today. So look through, uh, follow through, through 10 bucks here, pre-market high, stands at 10.10. And the whole thing is here is you're just in a big gap area. Uh, I don't know if that was from earnings or whatnot, but like if you're shorting this thing between here and a like 11 bucks, which is the bottom of the gap, there's just nothing in there. I guess these uh, at home braces thing, and you can't make it out to your dentist is uh, is a is the new deal here. They are the, searching around and looking for anything, any tech stock, and I guess you can say Smile Direct is kind of a tech stock. Smile Direct Tech. And- Smile Direct Tech. I, I I would classify it as probably some you know it's technology in your mouth, but you know whatever you know they're gonna throw it. They're looking. I don't for think any it's. I, I wouldn't of, call it tech. I would call it like uh like venture capital. Any funding. anything like yeah. that with you know some serious growth to it. They are searching for something that hasn't gone yet. Smile Direct was consolidating it for a few days. It's the exact reason why I bought Upwork. I was looking for a potential COVID play that hadn't gone yet. And I was like scrambling around. I was like, I could see it, you know, and that's why I bought a nine bucks. It's 11, 79, four days later. I mean, there's money in just doing your research and thinking, okay, where's the narrative going? The narrative continues to be growth tech, anything to do with, you know, still, you know, lockdown biotech. Play, but biotech, any of those narratives continue to work, continue to perform. So you look around and chat. If you guys got some ideas here, let us know because, you know, these narratives seem to work. Um, obviously, you know, we talked about that FLIR that I was on that for that narrative about um, the, the thermal imaging cameras. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I really actually want to go. Too. I actually want to go not to that, but to a similar play. A few people in the chat have mentioned Mark this morning. M A R K. I know this is not your wheelhouse necessarily, oh, but it's right in my wheelhouse. I I own it. What? So I own Mark. Yeah. He, yep. I bought Mark. I talked about it on the show with Jason Rasnick last week. This was a stock that I bought at oh, forty. Right. I paid forty cents for this. 
I bought this at 40 cents. The only reason I bought this, I bought this literally like four or five days before it started going because I was searching around on Twitter. This is how I found Mark. I was searching around and I'm going into Twitter and I'm like, I'm looking for thermal imaging plays. And the, there was a bunch of people buzzing around talking about this Remark Holdings, that this was a potential thermal imaging play. So I'm like, okay, I'll take a flyer in it. I took a flyer and bought a bunch of stock at 40 cents and it didn't do nothing for a day or two. And then it blasted off to like 60 cents and I sold some of it. And then it blasted off to 80 cents and I sold some more. And I'm like regretting all of those sales because the thing's $2 and 15 cents now. I, I don't know. I don't even know. I'm, I don't trade penny stocks. I got in it at an excellent point. I have no idea how the hell to get out of this. So I still have a chunk of stock. I've sold, I've sold the majority of the position on the way up. I've taken out my cost basis. I did all that stuff. I've taken out more profits, you know, than I've put into it. But, you know, I'm sitting here and I, I, people are asking me, you know, how do you know when to take, when to book the profits on this? You don't. I, 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 three, wait, you know, wait, it, you could see a couple times. We go to Joel Alconin for levels, but the story when you on this. Sell, so, when so the you story buy on something, this, I buy. When you when you sell something, I, I'm always I buy. out too soon. Don't follow me when I get out of my position. I always get out too soon. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. When you buy, I buy, and when you sell, I buy. <laughs> I know. I get out too soon every time. So. Oh boy, uh, just uh, someone's asking here about Datadog and. Uh, must be a tech stock, right? Trading up five bucks, five thirty-one. Any news on them, or is just uh, just? Uh... Uh, they are coming off of. I, I want to say it was earnings from. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, they had earnings yesterday after the close. So they love it. I mean, trading at highs a pre-market session up five thirty. You did. Someone's letting a little stock go at uh, sixty-two twenty-four, sixty-two forty. So keep an eye on that if you're looking for a target potential target but of course it takes that out who knows over a doubler here since uh march uh just one other stock here for we oh it's 903 oh my gosh spencer we really kept you over here we can uh go ahead and wrap it up okay uh the, yeah the data dog earnings report was good they beat on the earnings and they beat on the guidance so it was a double the doubly good report for data dog all right uh thank you to everyone who joined us today both uh via our, our chats or if you just listen that's cool too uh thanks to our guest craig Erlum. you can catch a replay of this show on youtube or on our podcast that's on itunes soundcloud stitcher spotify wherever you get your podcast please remember all the information from our show is meant to be used as informational purposes not for investing or training advice I, it's been a couple of days since i've made a new sign i'm kind of out of ideas for signs if, if you have an idea for a new sign from behind me let me know because i am out of ideas for that. So uh, everyone have a great day. Joel You're in our room too. I'm well. I'll take them down and whatever. Um, Joel and I will be back at 3:40. In the meantime, everyone have a great rest of your day and be safe wherever you are.